You can proceed, Mr. Prorector. Please unmute. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this academic ceremony in which Mr. Frederik Schaper will defend the academic thesis titled Mapping and Zapping, Deep Brain Stimulation Takes Hold of Epilepsy in Public. Um, before we do the actual opposition, the candidate will be uh, asked to give a short introduction, summary of the research, and the most important conclusions and recommendations. I give the floor to the candidate. Dear Pro-Rector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and colleagues. In the next 15 minutes, I will shortly present the research I've worked on in the last couple of years. I would like to start by pointing your attention to the cover of my thesis, which is an artistic representation of the human brain made by neuroscientist and artist, Greg Dunn. Now, looking at this a bit closer, it becomes clear that the human brain is a collection of complicated interconnected networks. And whenever I look at this, I always wonder how much better could our therapies for brain diseases be if we could only understand the human brain on this detailed level. Yet, our current understanding looks a bit more like this. We know that the brain is organized into different brain regions with specific functions, and that there are different networks that work together. However, how those networks exactly work together or are organized remains a mystery. And to simplify it all, I would like to compare this network with a circuit board in your iPhone. Let's take a closer look at the simplified version of the brain. Just like in your iPhone, there are different chips that are connected to each other through wires. Here in the middle is a central processor or CPU that connects most regions to each other. And it sort of works like a gatekeeper or a hub. Now, you can imagine that just like a circuit board in your iPhone, brain circuits are very vulnerable. Damage or lesions to different regions within the circuit can lead to a dysfunction of the circuit. One of the ways that lesions may damage the circuit is by creating short circuits, which are regions of excessive electrical activity that start in one region, but can quickly spread across the entire circuit. This circuit may then get seized by an uncontrolled electrical activity and can eventually break down. When this happens in the human brain, we call this a seizure. Most of you may recognize seizures by the characteristic uncontrolled tonic-clonic movements of the body. But depending on exactly where that lesion happens or short circuit starts, there may be a variety of symptoms such as confusion, fear, loss of consciousness, and falls that sometimes may even lead to death. Seizures are a symptom of epilepsy. Over 70 million people worldwide suffer from epilepsy, and it is the fourth most common neurological disease. Some of my favorite artists even have epilepsy, such as Prince, Ian Curtis, and Neil Young. Epilepsy is currently treated by reducing the number of seizures. You can reduce these seizures with anti-seizure drugs, which inhibit the entire brain. You can compare this with dimming the lights down in an electrical circuit. Anti-seizure drugs work for most patients, but sometimes there is a persistent source of activity that just does not respond to drugs. One in three patients do not respond to drugs, and the only way to cure them from their seizures is to take out this source by an invasive brain surgery. However, sometimes we just cannot find the source of activity, or the seizures even come back after surgery. For these patients with severe epilepsy, there is a relatively new treatment called deep brain stimulation, or DBS. Now, this is the therapy I studied during my PhD, and you can compare DBS with fine-tuning different circuits in your brain by targeting that central processor, or CPU. DBS is a minimally invasive neurosurgical procedure in which an electrode is inserted deep into your brain and connected through wires to a pulse generator or a battery. This battery sends electrical pulses deep into the brain to counteract that short circuit or those seizures. So DBS kind of works like a pacemaker for the brain during which you are continuously modulating a brain circuit. The target for DBS is the CPU because it is widely connected to many brain regions. In the human brain, this CPU is called the thalamus. 
and the electrode is placed in the most anterior part of the thalamus, or the ANT. Here on the right, you can see a DBS electrode implanted in the ANT. You can imagine that, depending on how well that surgery went, the DBS electrode may end up in different locations within the ANT. It is thus very common that the precise location of the DBS electrode varies across patients. And this brings me to the problem that I studied during my PhD. Since the DBS electrode location varies across patients, I tested whether the DBS location is important for seizure control and efficacy of the therapy. My specific research question was, what is the optimal DBS location and network associated with seizure control in DBS for epilepsy? Now let's start with that first important finding of my thesis that focuses on the DBS electrode location described in chapter six. In the first study, we analyzed a cohort of 20 patients that had DBS for epilepsy. Patients had an MRI before the surgery, shown on the left, and a CT after surgery with an implanted DBS lead on the right. To localize the exact location of this DBS electrode, we fused the two images together so they're in the same space and exactly overlap. This was all performed on a neurosurgical software that neurosurgeons use to plan their surgery. This is an example of what the neurosurgeon would see on his navigation system. The patient's MRI is in the background, and to make it a bit easier, I highlighted the structures of interest, namely the ANT and the mammalothalamic tract, or MTT. The blue line represents the DBS electrode trajectory, and at the end of it, you will find the DBS target as a red dot, where that tip of the electrode is ideally located. This target is in the bottom part of the ANT, right where the mammalothalamic tract, or MTT, ends, and it connects to the ANT and forms a circuit. This location is also called the ANT-MTT junction. Now, we were interested in whether stimulation of this specific red dot was related to seizure control. We therefore localized the DBS electrode in 3D, which would look something like this. Now, let's take a closer look at that. Here in blue, you can see the ANT right at the end of the mammalothalamic tract, or MTT. For each patient, we then identified both the coordinates for where the MTT ends and goes into the ANT and where the DBS electrode was located. We then calculated the shortest distance between those two spots in 3D. And we repeated this process for all 20 subjects that had DBS for epilepsy. In this image, it becomes clear that the exact location of the DBS electrode varies across patients. To see how the DBS location affects clinical outcome, we correlated this distance in 3D in each patient with seizure control after DBS. What we found is that the closer the DBS electrode is to the ANT-MTT junction, that red dot, the better seizure control was after DBS. However, we went further than that because this only tells you where the electrode ended up. It doesn't tell you where that stimulation field around the electrode is and where that, whether it reaches that stimulation field, whether it reaches that specific spot. We therefore computed the stimulation field or volume of activated tissue, the VAT, to identify the spatial extent of stimulation. Here in red, you can see the VAT or stimulation site. And again, we repeated this process for all subjects and then overlapped these stimulation fields on an anatomical atlas. On the left, you see a stimulation hotspot for patients with good seizure control after DBS and thus respond well to the therapy, while patients that did not improve had no hotspot at all. This hotspot for improved seizure control was exactly at the ANT-MTT junction, right where that white matter tract connects to the ANT and forms a circuit. So the findings from this first study thus showed that the DBS location varies across patients, the DBS location is related to seizure control, and the hotspot of stimulation is at the ANT-MTT junction. We therefore learned it is important exactly what spot in the ANT you hit with DBS to achieve good seizure control. Now this also has clinical relevance as neurosurgeons can adapt their DBS target to better position their electrode to hit the ANT-MTT junction, and neurologists can adapt their DBS programming to increase stimulation of this specific spot. 
We provide new evidence here that white matter tracts could be a novel, ta novel target in DBS for epilepsy. Now, this first study was focused on identifying the specific spot in the thalamus you would want to hit for seizure control in DBS. However, we know that the brain likely works in more complex connected brain circuits. So in the next study, we investigated whether the brain network you want to hit for seizure control in DBS epilepsy. And to do this, let's go back to that stimulation field I showed you before. The stimulation field or VAT, which is this red blob here, is a representation of the modulated tissue in the human brain. If we can figure out what this red blob is connected to, we can figure out what brain circuit is responsible for seizure control. What we just need is to go back to a circuit map to identify the connections of this VAT. And just like when you want to repair an iPhone, the first thing you do is you look at the circuit map exactly to identify where to repair it. Luckily, many other researchers around the world have recently completed such a circuit map or a wiring diagram of the human brain. And the two methods used to create this wiring diagram either look at the white matter tracks or wires connecting different regions here on the left, or fluctuations in brain activity linked across different brain regions here on the right. Now to identify the connections in DBS for epilepsy, we combined the stimulation field with the circuit map, also called a human connectome. We use the DBS location, that stimulation field, as a seed in the human connectome to create a DBS network map and thus identify the connections of that stimulation location. This relatively new technique is called DBS network mapping. We did this for a cohort of 30 patients that had DBS for epilepsy. But we didn't stop there. So remember at the start of my presentation, I told you that damage to specific brain regions can cause specific short circuits across the brain. Now, we think that there must be a relation between where that circuit is damaged and where I need to be with DBS to treat it. We therefore use the locations of brain lesions such as stroke, which is associated with epilepsy, to identify the brain network associated with lesion-related epilepsy. Each lesion location was again used as a seed in the human connectome to create a lesion network. This technique is also called lesion network mapping. We then tested whether these connections were similar for brain lesions and DBS. Indeed, we found that the network related to seizure control after DBS was the same network that was connected to lesion locations causing epilepsy. Lesion network mapping and DBS network mapping made us identify the same intrinsic brain network related to epilepsy. That network is defined by functional connectivity to the basal ganglia and cerebellum, regions that have previously been implicated in seizure modulation and termination of seizures in animal models of epilepsy. We thus provide here a new link between lesion studies and DBS studies in humans and modulation and termination of seizures in animal models of epilepsy. Interestingly, you can see that the colors are different for lesions and DBS. Lesions are blue, which means negatively connected to the basal ganglia and cerebellum, while DBS is orange and red, which means positively connected to the basal ganglia and cerebellum. Lesions and DBS may thus push this network into two opposite directions. And you can compare this with a seesaw where the lesion on the left pushes the network in a direction to cause seizures, while DBS on the right pushes the network in a direction to control seizures. However, more studies really need to be done to, fit, to figure out exactly how this network may cause or relieve seizures. So in this second study, we found that lesions causing epilepsy and DBS sites treating epilepsy map to a common brain network. This network is defined by functional connectivity to the basal ganglia and cerebellum, and these regions have previously been implicated in seizure modulation and termination of seizures in animal models of epilepsy. Now, this is also clinically relevant as these findings contribute to our understanding of epilepsy as a network disease, and this network map may even guide brain stimulation trials for epilepsy in the future. And if anything, I would like to leave you with this one take home message. If we continue combining information from brain stimulation and brain lesions with a wiring diagram of the human brain, like we did in this thesis, maybe one day we will get to this more detailed map of the human brain 
and change the way how we map and zap brain networks to treat epilepsy. Thank you for your attention. I will now give the floor back to the prorector. Thank you for that very clear and nicely illustrated introduction. The opposition will now be opened by Professor Rutten. He was the chair of the assessment committee and he's a professor of psychiatry at Maastricht University. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidates, uh, first of all, my congratulations and compliments to your work. It's truly a wonderful thesis, I think, and I highly appreciate the variety of, uh, of studies, of methodologies used, designs used, and also that you study different animal species, mice, humans, and so forth. I also want to congratulate your promotional team neuroscientists and clinical neurologists and clinical neurosurgeons. It's a wonderful team, I think, that you worked with, also in your international trajectory. Um, and I particularly enjoyed the richness of the innovative techniques that you just explained very nicely in the field of epilepsy. And I will come back also in a minute to chapter seven, where you also relate some of these techniques to the field of depression. Um, I also enjoyed while reading your thesis, the critical reflection you had and also the wider scope. Uh, and it was also referred to in your uh, statements, but also in the quotes that you put just in front of every of the three parts. Uh, wonderful quotes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, but I just also want to touch base with you on some uh, scientific issues. And I want to take you uh, to, uh, of course, chapter seven, uh, part three, where you do the computational studies. And chapter seven relates to the brain stimulation and brain lesion uh, study that converges on common causal circuitries in neuropsychiatric disease. Uh, I just first want to make a comment. Always when I, I see people, or particularly neuroscientists or neurologists and neurosurgeons, talk about mental disorders, they suddenly talk about neuropsychiatric diseases. I, I don't understand why they do it. Uh, but I would propose that you use the term mental disorders and then the specific types of these, uh, but neuropsychiatric seems that there's a different type of mental disorders. I, I don't think so, because I think every mental disorder is mediated via the brain. Uh, and I think it would also be nice to see this reflected in, in titles of important uh, research uh, manuscripts. Now, going to a first methodological question. So in chapter seven, you, you pull together, I think, 14 different data sets and you analyze them, and also 14 quite innovative data sets. And what I know from new data coming from DBS or TMS is that often they are uh, biased in the sense that positive findings are often reported first in the scientific literature. So I was searching for, uh, uh, now rather you tested for publication bias in these 14 data sets. I didn't see this, but probably you did consider this, and I was First of all, wondering, uh, A, did you consider this? And, and B, how did you and how did you consider this if you did so? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you so thank you so much for your kind words. It's it's really an honor to have you in my committee too. And um, thank you also for your question. Um, uh, first, uh, to respond to your first comment, uh, I will definitely change the name to mental disorders instead of neuropsychiatric disorders. Maybe a rotation in psychiatry will help with that in my future, definitely. Um, then to your, to your question, um, publication bias is definitely a big problem uh, in the field, especially in the kind of field that I was working on during my thesis, which is mainly a retrospective field. So I analyzed existing data sets. Um, the funny thing is, however, the main studies that were performed that look at lesions that cause depression were really in the mid 20th century, uh, where they found some relationship between damage to the left DLPFC and the cause of depression. Now, that was, I think, a finding by Robinson, which was found, but then never really perfectly got replicated. Some studies did find that damage to the left DLPFC caused more depression. Some studies did not. So I believe that in those studies where there was, uh, um, there was a positive finding at the start, People tested whether there was whether it was a false positive finding. Some studies replicated, some studies did not. And this is exactly where we think that this technique helps the most. Because this technique of lesion network mapping sees the brain as a circuit. 
And what we always do in these studies is we first try to replicate the studies that were done before. So we do a VLSM, a voxel-based lesion symptom mapping analysis, looking just at the lesion location, if we can replicate it. Now, we, we didn't replicate that finding by Robinson, actually. We did not find a higher risk of depression when the left DLPFC was damaged, just looking at the anatomical location. We could only find that finding once we used that human connector and that circuit map. Um, we could find a, a relationship between connectivity of the lesion and depression. So uh, I think that we controlled for it in that sense that we tried to replicate these previous studies, failed to do so with lesion location, but did find uh, uh, a similar, similar statistical result in the same direction uh, with the connectivity results. Okay, I understand. So you did, you did not formally statistically test this, but you considered it and you uh, addressed it as well. So many things. Correct. Correct. And we also included 14 data sets. So I think that reduces the risk of false positive findings. No, I don't completely agree. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's more than 10 at least. So that, that may sure. help. Yeah. So I want to, to move forward and, and to go to the same chapter and, and focus on your, uh, which I really, really appreciated on your... Uh, interest in depression, but also particularly in changing depression over time with treatment, uh, right? So that's something that uh, not that many people do. People no normally look at cross-sectional uh, differences on, on certain uh, scores and so forth. You did it, uh, you investigated changes over time, which is, is, uh, is very important, I think, uh, in a kind of a transdiagnostic uh, manner, which I don't fully agree. But anyway, uh, my question relates to the structure of the phenotype of depression. Now, you measured uh, total depression scores, or you took this from the literature from the other papers, and you said, okay, these are total scores and changes in total scores uh, related to um, uh, DBS or, or TMS and so forth. Uh, but as a psychiatrist, uh, I probably also consider this, this, this different types of depression uh, per se, but there's also different factors underlying depression scores in the scientific literature. And I guess you didn't statistically test for these, but I would think, for example, there's nine criteria to fulfill with a depressive disorder. There's, there's 24 symptoms that you can put into these criteria. So many, many different combinations can, can, uh, can be started. And it's mostly like cognitive affective factor and effective related to uh, somatic issues like appetite, change, weight gain, sleep problems, and so forth. So in your studies, I was wondering, either did you analyze or investigate different sub-items in these depression scores, or you only took the entire score? And uh, if, you would, if you didn't do so, and you would like to do so, how would you address this? Because I think it's interesting that you see this convergence in this connectome uh, linking to depression, but I don't, don't know what it means. Uh, so that may help in maybe better pinpointing or linking this uh, functional network with maybe certain sub uh, items or, or certain phenotypes that are more specific? Yeah, uh, firstly, great idea. Um, so in this study, we only looked at the total depression score because that is the score that we had for these data sets. So in that sense, it's limited that we couldn't, for each data set, do that. We, of course, wanted to, but we, weren't, we couldn't do that because we didn't have the data. Now, definitely, I think we should move more towards symptom-specific circuits than just a total depression circuit. However, what this study does shows is that there is at least one thing that combines them all. There is at least one common structural network likely that, that makes people depressed or is associated with a lesion causing depression. Um, but it explains around less than 10% of the variance, I think. Um, so that means that there's a lot more, actually, that, that is different between them. And uh, now we didn't in investigate in this data set, but we did do that in a different study, which is not included in the thesis. For instance, in uh, people that had TMS for uh, major depression, uh, and there we had two different data sets where we did have subscores, like you're saying now. And there we did look at, are there different networks that cluster together? Uh, and are they related to specific scores? And what we found is that there are two networks. Um, if you really pull the threshold down, there are two global networks. One is more anxiosomatic, and one is more um, uh, loss of appetite, et cetera. So more anhedonic. 
so in the future, and we're, running, we're actually running a trial on this in Boston here, where we stimulate different spots in the DLPFC to try and either increase the anxiety symptoms or more the anhedonia and the apathy symptoms. That's wonderful. And before giving the word back to the pro rector, I just want to mention that it would also be good to caution whether the brain mediates things or is the cause or is also the, the focus of the treatments. I think that those may be three different uh, uh, issues. Anyway, many thanks and I give the word back to the pro rector. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Visser. She is a professor of stereotactic and functional neurosurgery in Köln, Germany. Okay, thank you, Roberto. So, dear candidates, my sincere congratulations to you and your promotion team, your promoter and the two co-promotors. Um, I also appreciate, like Professor Rutten said, uh, your approaching from different angles uh, the problem uh, you tackle. So, animal research, electrophysiological data, am, uh, animal data, uh, and so on. So, uh, I would like to start this, the discussion now, and my first question relates to chapter three, the animal experiments. So your starting point is the Santé trial. Epilepsy patients with a rather normal uh, memory function receive uh, uh, thalamic stimulation of the anterior nucleus. There is uh, a certain effect on uh, seizures. You have mentioned this in your thesis. But there's also a risk of memory um, um, disturbance, dysfunction. So you want to tackle this problem, and therefore you use a rat model for epilepsy. This is the SL, uh, SSLSE model. So you stimulate the hippocampus, then you wait for several uh, weeks, and then you uh, have a memory deficit. How pronounced, how severe was this a memory deficit that you compare it with uh, the memory function before the hippocampal stimulation? And how well was it representative for memory function in those uh, patients in the Santé trial? Because in the end you say, okay, then in those rats, DBS at high frequency leads to a memory improvement. So here you have a memory deficit, and then with high frequency stimulation, an improvement. In the patients, we had a normal memory function or not. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And then high frequency stimulation leads to memory dysfunction. So is this a good model? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your nice words and thank you for your question. Um, as you probably have already read in my discussion, um, I also have a lot of reservations as to how much these animal model findings, and specifically this study that I carried out here, can be translated into the human. And that's kind of the grander question you're asking here. Uh, specifically for the memory, uh, we did not test memory before status epilepticus was in induced. So unfortunately, I, I cannot say as to how much the memory uh, um, has been declined due to epilepsy. What I can only say that in previous studies in our lab, we found um, uh, spatial location deficits in this model. Um, and I think that was about half the normal uh, uh, normal um, um, performance of a, of a rat. Um, but we, I didn't test it in these animals, so I cannot specifically say that. Um, what, I, what I can say is that the spatial location effect found in this study in, in five animals, which is a very limited animal studies compared to other animal studies, is really, really small. And even after multiple comparisons correction, uh, this would not be significant. So, so the, the, the effect is not large. Um, the interesting thing is, is that we didn't see a decline in memory, which is what you would expect. Uh, what we did was found a, an improvement of memory, which is in line with the long-term results of the Sante study that also showed an improvement of memory. Um, so that's the interesting thing that in this new model, we found a, an improvement of memory as opposed to a deficit of memory. Okay, so thank you. And then I have another question. So in the conclusion, I read, um, low frequency anterior nucleus uh, DBS may first have an anti-epileptic effect in mice, but then in another chapter in page on page uh, 94, I read that high frequency stimulation might protect against seizures. So this sounds confusing. This is one. And then second, you write in this uh, chapter three that low frequency uh, thalamic stimulation. Uh, may be critical to improve cognition. So how do you make this jump? Because I think, I think you didn't test low-fixity stimulation in uh, your RAP model. 
completely correct. I did not test low frequency stimulation. Um, so that reference comes because uh, Wang et al. did this actually in mice, did a very similar experiment in mice, and they did include low frequency stimulation. And what they found was both a, a good effect on seizure control, which I was not able to replicate, and a good effect of low frequency DBS on uh, cognitive outcomes, so spatial location uh, testing. So I was mainly referring to our study showed that HFS, so high frequency, could improve memory in line with the Sante study, with, which there's human evidence for. And there's also this other animal mice study that's very similar to mine that did show an effect. So I'm, I'm mainly referencing the literature there. Okay, thank you. And then a the last uh, question. So then you say in the discussion in chapter three, so low frequency stimulation might improve cognition in mice. And then you refer to uh, the clinic and you say that it has been shown in um, patients, and then you quote reference 25. But when I look at reference 25, it's about fornix uh, stimulation. Yes, exactly. So, th so that reference is, is, is not about ANT stimulation, but it's low frequency stimulation in general. And, and the idea is, is that uh, low frequency stimulation might improve, um, might improve spatial location outcome independent of where the target is. Might it it should be in the circuit of Papez. Okay, so might it be related to the fact that you stimulate tracts or nuclei? Yes, definitely. I definitely think it's related to stimulating tracts, indeed. Uh, and I think that is also probably more likely the fact that you're stimulating tracts with low frequency stimulation. Because you need a certain high frequency to disrupt that gray matter and to get, that, um, to get the depolarization block in the gray matter. So I definitely think that low frequency stimulation probably works more through stimulating tracks. Okay, I have more questions, but to start, I'll give the word back to uh, the director. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Leti Maki. He is an associate professor of neurosurgery in Tampere. Thank you. And uh, congratulations, Frederick. Great work you have done. And Congratulations to your team as well. Um, I really enjoyed uh, reading your thesis and that's huge, huge work and uh, thick book. I really enjoyed every minute. And there's many, many years reading and learning from, from this thesis. But I still have a few questions and I, I see that you have tried uh, to solve the same problems we have struggled in our team in Tampere. We have tried to figure out same same things basically. And uh, I would like to ask uh, about chapter six. So the role of the mammalian tract in seizure control. I think this is a topic we discuss much uh, with neurosurgeons all the time. So uh, you saw uh, showed the nice color image of responders and non-responders, uh, my atlas coronal, coronal uh, plate. Uh, and we saw that the responders have this uh, high uh, level of overlap in the area where ANT and mammalian tract uh, join each other. So what can you tell about the non-responders? There was really not that much overlap anywhere. So, so how would you uh, describe the non-responding implants? as a group? Was there kind of one type of implants or was there a mixture of, 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 of how, what were those implants like? Can you describe a little bit? Esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your kind words and your question. Um, uh, we do um, um, try and solve the same problems, uh, we, which is great. And I think it really strengthen, strengthens the studies that we do. Because um, I looked at your publication from 2015 in brain stimulation, and I kind of took that as a guide for, for this study. Uh, so first, thank you for that. Um, the non-responder group here is very interesting because I was expecting to find a hotspot somewhere else, but I didn't find that at all. So I found a more scattered location of these DBS sites. Now that could mean two things. It could mean that the neurosurgeon placed the electrode and they just ended up a bit more posterior in the dorsal ANT bit more lateral, not really in the ANT, but in the ventral anterior nucleus or another thalamic nucleus. And, and they stayed there. It could also be, and we didn't test this, uh, I should have tested it, but we didn't. Uh, it could also be that the neurologist was programming the stimulation site around this electrode and could not find any response. Thus, there was a random distribution of these stimulation fields. 
Now, why is that? That remains a question. So I, I don't know which of the two causes it, but that would be my hypothesis, that it's one of the two. Um, the interesting thing is there is specificity here because if you, because that's kind of the question what you're asking, what is the specificity? And the specificity is, um, is shown in the graph where you see the correlation that the further you move away from this specific spot, seizure control becomes less. So, so I do think there is a both sensitive, which is the responders overlap, that's the sensitivity result, and there is also some specificity. If I would do it again, I would do it completely different uh, with a better specificity test. I mean, uh, patients have, for example, at one year time point, they have one seizure reduction count. It could be 90 or 50 or something, but patients mm -hmm. have two hemispheres and two thalamus. So did you average the equilibrium distance from MDD junction? So how did you take into account if on the left side, the implant is perfectly in the junction, but the right side is completely somewhere else? How did you tackle this, mm -hmm. this problem? Yeah, exactly. So in, in this study, what we did is uh, we just took the mean of the two hemispheres. So that means one lead could be implanted perfectly and the other one could not be implanted right. And then we overlap them all on one hemisphere. Uh, and that kind of gives you um, an underestimation of how how good actually your, your electrode can be located. Because it could be that someone has a left uh, unilateral source uh, or, or seizure onset zone. So only the left lead needs to be placed perfectly. So if I would have a bigger data set, that's the analysis I would do. I would see where is probably the seizure onset zone. Does that relate to that location where the DBS electrode is? And can the other electrode then be a bit off or not? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, here, I think the paper basically says that the mammalothalamic tract junction a and area is the hot spot for epilepsy. So can you um, uh, comment a little bit? Can you say that this target is superior to kind of the center of a and target, which would be our kind of uh, traditional way to go. So can you comment, can you prove that this is superior or is it equal or how could, how could you uh, comment on that? So I think based on this study alone, I cannot prove that, that the center of the a and wouldn't be just as good or, or better. What I can say is that probably both locations would stimulate this hotspot almost equally well, depending on how much voltage you use and how, how the neurologist is programming the stimulator. Um, the reason exactly why I cannot say that is because the uh, trajectory here that we take is different than the conventional trajectory, which is a transventricular trajectory like in the Sante trial. Um, so we probably didn't stimulate the superior part of the ANT to actually test that specificity to that central spot. So, so you would need a data set of transventricular trajectories. So if you uh, had an imaginary group of patients and implants, so how would you design a study to prove the superiority or inferiority of MTT junction or ANT center stimulation? How would you design a study to prove which one is better target? So best design would probably be you include a, a, a cohort of anti dbs patients. Um, if we want to keep ethics into account, we cannot change the target that much. <laughs> um, so what, what we do is we implant everyone and then do a crossover design so that um, uh, some people get uh, in an arm where you get stimulation of the ANT MTT junction specifically with a relatively low voltage. And then the center of the ANT in the other arm, you do a washout and then a crossover. I think that would probably do it best. The other way to test it, which is probably if you don't have a big grant to do it and you need it done fast, I would say, um, let's let's go back to those non-responders we had and try and reprogram them to these specific spots and see if they then respond to seizure uh, to therapy or not. I think that's probably the easiest test and the first one was the best test. Great. Uh, I do have one more uh, question left. So if you have an implant, a nice contact just in the a and MTT junction and you stimulate approximately four or five uh, volts amplitude uh, and the VTA is probably, I don't know, three millimeters around the lead approximately. So do you think that the current will reach cortical fibers, which leave anterior nucleus to singular cortex? Do you think that the hotspot you are stating uh, actually stimulates neuronal networks that go to cortex to single? Is, is it enough to reach those fibers? Do you have a short answer to that question, please? 
Short answer is yes, definitely. Okay, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Jahan Shani. He is an associate professor of neurosurgery here in Maastricht. Uh, thank you, Pro Rector. Um, dear candidate, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you and your uh, team of supervisors for this uh, great piece of work. I really enjoyed reading it, uh, and uh, uh, and I think you have contributed to the field uh, really uh, a lot. So in the interest of time, I go directly to the questions. And my questions are about chapter eight, uh, where you um, the, the main conclusion of uh, this chapter and also your thesis is that, that there is a common uh, pathway uh, underlying uh, pleptogenesis. Um, and uh, there are uh, a couple of areas uh, that, uh, that these areas also is, is uh, uh, I'm also interested in, uh, in terms of uh, my research line. Uh, these are GPI and substantial Nigra. Uh, first off, uh, are we talking about SNR or SNC? Because uh, I mean, given the, the, the special resolution of techniques that you have used, probably it's very difficult to uh, discriminate between SNR and SNC, but these two areas are quite different and they, they have distinct uh, projection patterns, neurotransmitters. Well, to me, um, I think it's more likely to be SNR because you have found GPI there, and these then they both they are uh, output the structure of the basal ganglia. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. Um, definitely, the, the resolution of this connectome is two by two by two millimeters. So it's very difficult to distinguish between substantia nigra compacta and substantia nigra reticulata. Uh, what, I, what I can say, looking at the anatomical atlases, is that it's probably more the substantia nigra reticulata, and that also fits more with the connections that the GPE has to the thalamus and the nigra has to the thalamus with those projections. There is some bleeding into the, um, into the compacta and red nucleus uh, that goes kind of like the reticular system. Uh, but it stops right there. It stays around the nigra. So it's definitely more substantia nigra reticulata and specifically the posterior part of the nigra. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I agree with that. Um, so um, you suggest that uh, GPI and now we, we talk about the SNR, these two areas uh, could be targeted uh, um, with deep brain stimulation for uh, seizure control. Uh, this reminds me of movement disorders. These are common, I mean, at this GPI, uh, the output structure of the basal ganglia are common target for, uh, um, to, to manage the symptoms in uh, movement disorders. Uh, given the basal ganglia thalamocortical loop and uh, uh, the working mechanism, the models that have been suggested, um, how do you think DBS is going to work here? Uh, for instance, GPI is targeted for dystonia or PD, and in PD, uh, the idea is to disinhibit thalamus. Um, do you think uh, that the same recipe can be applied here, or um, in terms of stimulation parameters, uh, you know, the, the, the stimulation regimen, um, and, and the, the model that is going to explain the outcomes? Yes, so, so I do think the same stimulation paradigm can be used. So high frequency stimulation in the GPI, substantial nigra cerebellum. I would like to highlight though, um, I wouldn't say that we already have this now as a target and we should go in there with the DBS electrode to stimulate the circuit. What I would say um, is that the connectivity to these structures defines the circuit. So you would also have cortical sites that are connected to the circuit that you could target. And I think going in there with DBS electrodes might be a step too soon. Uh, Non-invasive would be my preference to test this network first, but indeed, eventually you could you could go there and you could put an electrode in the substantia nigra reticulata, cerebellum, or GPI to modulate uh, seizures. Um, so yes, high frequency stimulation would be my choice, and the reasons that I have in the literature for that are as follows. So first, the risk of seizures after DBS in movement disorders is very very low. Surprisingly low, actually, when you do STN, DBS, or GPI. If you compare that to targets in OCD or, or pain or other, other uh, uh, non-movement disorders, the seizure risk is higher. So I think it's fairly safe to go in there in a patient with epilepsy. The second clinical reason I have is that once a patient with um, uh, epilepsy gets Parkinson's disease um, at the early stages, Sometimes they become seizure-free and their seizures are controlled. This is an observation in the New England from 1900. 
Um, and there's a whole group by Karen Gale working on inhibiting with optogenetics and, and these hemogenetic techniques, the substantia nigra to, in, to inhibit that structure to control seizures. So yes, I would pick the same paradigm as in movement disorders, and I would feel fairly safe doing that in patients with epilepsy. Um, so um, again, this um, hyperemesis stimulation uh, in these areas uh, reminds me of the models that uh, has, have been proposed for uh, working as a working mechanism of uh, PBS uh, in movement disorders. And uh, the ultimate goal is, is uh, um, uh, informational lesioning and ablation uh, of the area. And also the, the evidences that you provide the optogenetic uh, inhibition or, or lesions due to a stroke or high frequency stimulation. Um, so you think that uh, basically we need to um, inhibit a, a motor pathway uh, in order to uh, manage the seizures or you go for uh, um, other subterritories or uh, we know these days that basal ganglia, they, have, they are not only motor uh, controlling uh, pathways. We know that they have uh, subterritories that they have different connectors. Yes, exactly. And, and this gets to a very interesting point, right? Because do we need to activate this system to control seizures or do we need to inhibit it? And there's actually evidence for both of that in the literature. For the nigra, it's pretty solved. For the nigra, it's really you need to inhibit the substantia nigra reticulata. And the group that is working on that has a specific hypothesis on that, that they figured out with optogenetics. Namely, if you inhibit the substantia nigra, you lesion the inhibitory GABAergic neurons that go through the superior colliculus. And the superior colliculus can desynchronize the cortex. So if you, if you inhibit the nigra that is inhibiting the colliculi, you are desynchronizing the cortex and helping seizures. So it, indeed, like you're saying, a disinhibition working mechanism. For the cerebellum, there are kind of discussion about it because some people stimulate the deep cerebellar nuclei with excitatory optogenetic uh, stimulation, and they find a reduction of, um, they find inhibition of thalamocortical synchrony and temporal lobe seizures. Some actually uh, lesion the dentate, and that's also been done in humans in the 1960s, and we also found seizure reductions. So exactly in what way we have to push this network, which was that last slide what I showed you, is unclear yet. Uh, my prediction would be for the nigra, you lesion it, for the GPI, you lesion it too. And for the cerebellum, it's just too complicated there. That It's such a beautiful structure. I would like to dig into it more, but it's very complicated. I, I wouldn't take a guess. Yeah, it's a circuitry is completely different. Um, I mean, the yeah. synchronization oscillation that we, in the, we, we see in the brain, uh, I, I think it has to do with the, with the compact neuronal uh, um, population there. 70% of neurons are, are packed in cerebellum. Okay, um, I think we are on the same page, uh, uh, and then uh, I give the work uh, back, back to ProRector. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Marjois. She is a, a professor of epilepsy at Kempenhagen. Can you unmute, please? Please unmute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, ProRector and uh, dear candidates for uh, deep brain simulations. For a lot of people, a black box, but not for you anymore. The amount of work you have done to get a grip of uh, what happens when you place nanotrot in the brain and start simulating shows enthusiasm. It's, it shows perseverance and also serendipity. You have dared to look in uh, and find and, and find and uh, partly find also a structure in the enormous amount of um, variables that determine the effect of the brain stimulation, which is great. You have uh, found your way to various publications, you did animal um, research and translated it to human research. So, a lot of credits for that. And uh, I also want to, to congratulate your uh, promotion team. It's a uh, it's a great work, but but I still have questions. The first questions I have is in chapter four. In chapter four, you describe the literature, um, the, the rationale, the effect and the side effect of DBS, but it's very difficult to um, judge the quality of the review. I, I missed the search string and I also miss how many papers you have select or deselect, uh, but, but Probably it's not a systematic review. And so I have questions just to 
put the results in the right context. Um, I suppose that only the Sante trial is an RCT trial and the others are non-randomized control. Is that, that's correct, oh, thank you. Um, and the, you, you mentioned case control, but are those case control studies or, or also before or after comparisons? Or is it the mix? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. Uh, it's a mix. So indeed, some are open label, some are natural studies where they just follow the patients in time and don't even have a control group uh, or not even a sham uh, situation because it's just the normal clinical patients. So indeed, the evidence other than the Sante trial that it's effective is pretty low. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And, and if you look at the Sante trial, then you have a picture of 29% of uh, seizure frequency re reduction related to the unstimulated group. But if we look at the uh, case uh, case control studies, those are different figures. Uh, just to compare them, do you also have uh, figures of the comparison between uh, the seizure reduction at the end of the RCT period compared to the baseline periods so that you can compare it with the case control? Uh, yes, definitely. And so. So, so that is there for the Sante trial, indeed. So th mm -hmm. there is indeed a, a sham group that was included in the Sante trial and a three-month or five-month sham period. Um, mm -hmm. So, And there they also had um, a, a reduce in seizures from baseline to the end of the sham period. But also in the sham group, uh, so the non-stimulated group, there was also a reduction. So there is, this, there is a placebo effect, too. It's around 15%, I believe. Yeah. And the interesting thing, in the, in the first publication of the Sante trial, only in the last month, of the blinded period, kind of lucky they were, it was significant. It was not in those previous months. And maybe that's one of the reasons why there was such a holdup in approving uh, the study and this therapy by the FDA. Exactly, yeah, thank you. That's, that was what I was uh, looking at. Uh, and then I have a question about the SUDAP cases. You mentioned a number of four SUDAP cases in 110 patients, but in what period was it? Was it in RCT period? Then it's an enormous amount of uh, SUDEP, or was it in the five-year or the seven-year follow-up? This was indeed in the seven-year follow-up, and a recent paper oh. published a 10-year follow-up. Yeah, so it's not in the it's not in the blinded period, thank God. No. Yeah, yeah, indeed, thank God. But then I will go to uh, chapter six. In the, the, there were already uh, many questions about chapter six. You um, you have 20 patients, 10 uh, responders and 10 non-responders, but how did you select those patients? Or did you select the most uh, favorable patients for your study? Or was it a cohort? Uh, an, uh... A great question. No, we, we included everybody. So um, it was a relatively new technique and uh, it started in 2011, I think, is when uh, a neurosurgeon did the first implantation. And then we had about a few cases a year so up to the time that I started my PhD, we had, I think, 15 or something. And then during the end of my PhD, I had 30 in total. So that analysis of that paper was the 20 patients we had included that also had a one-year follow-up time, which was the inclusion criteria. We only included patients with at least one-year follow-up because you cannot really say if DBS did anything before that one-year follow-up. I, I hope I have the time for that because I really want to know. Uh, in those in the follow-up periods, um, were there many changes in uh, in therapy? Because you have uh, you you described many details about the precise location of stimulation, and you made those uh, visualizations about the hot about the hot spot. But that was one week after the operation, after surgery, and then you have a follow-up of a year. Is it possible that there were many changes in therapy which might change? The picture of the hotspot, the, the, the stimulation parameters going from unipolar to bipolar, um, etc. So yes, that is possible. So you could indeed uh, put the stimulator on and contact one as a neurologist and then change that to contact two or three. So in theory, that's possible. But that's not really what we found in this cohort. So most of these patients were just put on contact one or two, which one was the one closest to the center of the ANT. Mm -hmm. And that, that was actually carried forward for a year. And I, and I really need to um, um, 
let's say, congratulate or say the neurologist that they really kept it steady. <laughs> so thank you to them that they didn't change too much in that follow-up period. Uh, so, so luckily, they did not. No. What, what could have changed, though, and what wouldn't change the, the hotspot location is the anti-epileptic drugs. And those mm -hmm. did change. So we don't know how the anti-epileptic drugs um, changed the uh, seizure frequency um, as opposed to how much the DBS did of that, uh, inherent to a naturalistic study. That's for the next uh, study when you have a big grant. And I think okay. I have to give back to the prorector because my time is uh, done by now. Thank you very much. Your position will now be continued by Dr. Ten Uver. She is an assistant professor of cognitive neuroscience at this university. Uh, dear candidate, also congratulations from my side. I really enjoyed working it, uh, reading your thesis. I really could see the progression of your of also you during your PhD. I think during this thesis, it felt like really. Uh, progressing through while reading it. Uh, I have some questions specifically through the methods related in chapter seven and eight. Specifically, chapter seven is called, it, it talks about ca causal circuits. And I have a question about this causality here. Um, what is done in this method is that you calculate like the functional connectivity maps from a seed region. And the seed region is based on either uh, clinical outcomes uh, of depression in, in chapter seven. Um, either by treatment, by stimulating, or by the lesions. Um, and um, the goal is then to find a map that actually gives you possibilities for brain stimulations, I would guess. Um, but the procedure does, goes as follows. First, you have a seat and you correlate this with the rest of the brain. But you know by advance that the seat has a clinical outcome because that's where you start out. Uh, so a priori, you will also know that the seed region will also co-vary with your treatment effect. So you will know that statistically anything that will co-vary will show a treatment effect. So how can you be so sure that those regions that then you find in other brain regions also sh would be a good target uh, for treatment? How would you causally know that? Because that's what it seems to be suggested in this method. Uh, so that's my my question here related to this methodology. I, I hope to see your answer here. <laughs> uh, esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your kind words and your question. Um, Definitely, I agree with you. The word causal is a sensitive thing. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I was actually doubting of putting it in. Uh, <laughs> but I do think if you compare the, the landscape of functional MRI and resting state fMRI um, and, and where we are going to in the future, I think it helps to take sources of causal information. And the word causal mainly refers to that source. So the lesion is causing the depression. We know that just like a stroke causes an aphasia. So there is a causal relationship between the lesion location that is damaged and the symptom, like Broca's area. Um, so in that sense, I think it is fair to say that there is a more causal relationship than if you would do a resting state FRI. However, causality is more something that's on a spectrum. So indeed, the, what you're saying is that, is this now a target to treat depression? Because are you really modulating that causal circuit? That's something you would have to find out. You would need to perturb the circuit and see if that's really the case. Um, however, what we did see is when we did this in other disorders like Parkinsonism and tremor, is that when you look at the lesions that cause tremor and the DBS sites that cause tremor, they line up in the same target. So instead of using the serendipity that was always used before for identifying DBS targets, which is just trial and error or people that had a stroke in that area, you can now systematically go through it. So that's what I think that the innovation is here. And please remind me of your specific I think more of a statistical comparison that you asked. Well, like statistically, because things co-vary, they will, by definition, show an effect, a statistical effect. So it's not sh strange that you find these maps overlapping because statistically, it means if you start out with a, an effect and you just correlate one part of this effect with something else, that other part will also correlate therefore you will find these maps um but i think actually like i have no problem with it it's mostly about the 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 brain's target part and you you answered that very correctly so, so we I did use I'm... control data sets so yeah. so we did have people that had a lesion a stroke and did not have depression yeah um so that's a, that's a test of specificity and also we also had continuous scores for depression so there are some locations that are more related to depression as to others that are less related to depression in a patient that has depression 
So comparing patients with depression to control, there is the specificity. And within patients with depression, with a higher, more severe depression, which shows the same circuit. So I would say that you test for that, let's say, correlation a priori by including your control group. No, by, yeah, by including your control group, you have more variance across the, the depression scale. And that variance helps you actually to find these correlations. But yeah, the, it, it is a beautiful map. And, and the difficulty is that it overlaps. That to me is the strongest point that it overlaps across those three methods. That is strong. Uh, but just finding a map is by definition, you will find a map of sure. a network. Yeah. Sure, um, sure. But it doesn't have to be different. Um, I, I, I do, I think of a way to test that though. So what you could do is instead of getting these lesions associated with depression, you could get virtual lesions that are just randomly distributed across the brain. So that would be one of the ways where you can see um, if you have this like control model, if, if you wouldn't find the same map. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it also brings me to a general question if I, or to, uh, of your thesis. Everything seems to relate to finding a map that is common across everybody and one location that we can find. But on the other hand, there's a lot of work that actually tries to individualize uh, treatments. So my question is, what is your thought on this? Do you think these methodologies introduced could also be used for individualizing? Or you think this is less relevant maybe for, for epilepsy? Or what is your th general thought on this individualization of treatments? Definitely. It, it, the, the focus was on finding common brain circuits. Mm -hmm. But I would never um, oppose the fact that there are individual brain circuits. And we know this because if you take out the focus in a patient with epilepsy, they become seizure free. So mm -hmm. we know through decades of work that probably individual circuits are more important than common brain circuits. Um, however, um, I do think it's important to find these common brain circuits because it gives you a guide as to if you don't know where to go, then this is your best guess on where you would go. Or mm -hmm. if you want to optimize the stimulation site that we have chosen, then better make it a bit more anterior, just like we did with the BMF3 method instead of the five and a half centimeter method and with the anti-correlation to the subgenual. I think there is improvement that can be done using these kinds of methods. And I think that's where the beauty and the value lies in this technique, um, but not so much in individualization, which you would need to really scan patients themselves. Mm. Okay. I'm sure you've heard the beetle. <laughs> I have. Um, you didn't? Okay. No, actually, no. Okay. Well, that... We, we all heard that. Um, Mr. Schaper, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return. Just one second, we're experiencing uh, difficulties with opening the room.
Frederik Schaper, the Greek committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Temel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom, and I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Frederick Scharper, cum laude, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beetle. Brilliant, congratulations. Thank you so much. Fred, we have a laudatio for you. Uh, ik een deel en de andere deel is van Dr. Roel en um, ja, beste Fred, beste dokter Schaper, proficiat met het behalen van het doctoraat en met cum laude, wat ben ik toch trots op jou. Jij kwam als een 19-jarige student gezondheidswetenschappen naar mij in 2009 en vroeg of je onderzoek kon doen. De timing van de vraag was goed, namelijk we konden hulp gebruiken. Onze groep was aan het groeien. Dat jij een bijzondere student was, hadden we eigenlijk al snel door. Vooral jouw attitude, hè, leergierig, de juiste vragen stellen, met eigen ideeën komen en vooral wetenschappelijke creativiteit maakte jou anders. Jij viel op. In die tijd werkte Renske Vlamings bij ons. Eerst ook als studentassistent en daarna als promovendus. Zij werd jouw dagelijkse begeleider. Jullie vormden een succesvolle duo. Je werd snel zelfstandig en kon delen van neurowetenschappelijke experimenten zelf doen. Jij werd een van onze ambassadeurs. Je ging op buitenlandse werkbezoeken en stages. En liet altijd een zeer goede indruk achter. Zo goed dat je elke keer weer een uitnodiging kreeg voor een vervolg, vervolgbezoek. Jij was productief met presentaties op congressen en publicaties. Jij kon studenten inspireren en motiveren voor neurowetenschappelijk onderzoek. Nu ben jij een volwassen onderzoeker geworden. Je hebt nog heel veel te geven aan het veld van neurostimulatie. Ik ben ervan overtuigd dat jij nog zeer bijzondere bijdrage gaat leveren aan het veld. Ik zou zeggen, ga vooral door, Fred, in die ingeslagen weg. Jij bent de ideale neurotraveler. Zowel in letterlijke zin, waar je allemaal wel niet geweest bent voor neuroonderzoek, maar ook in figuurlijke zin, kijk hoe je werkt aan hersengebieden en hersenbanen. Ten slotte, cum laude past bij jou als geen ander. Van de 37 afgeronde promoties bij mij ben jij een van de twee complote doktoren. Volgens mij zegt dit genoeg. Akuna Matata. Zeer geleerde heer Schapen. Beste Fred, je promotiedraject zit erop. Vertel me later nog maar eens, zijn de tijden voor en na nu echt zo veranderd? We leren elkaar kennen in de ACO. Ik als docent en jij als student. En dat heb ik geweten. Met een aantal medestudenten moest je toen een onderzoeksvoorstel uitwerken dat gevoed werd door een klinische vraag die jullie in de praktijk waren tegengekomen. En dat moest natuurlijk iets op neurologisch gebied zijn. En jij wist je collega-studenten daar goed van te overtuigen. 
En het proces daarna heb je er ook alles aan gedaan om het tot een succes te maken. Waarbij het je ook nog lukte om extra meetings met mij als docent te plannen. En nog extra feedback los te krijgen. Toen je aanklopte bij mij van combi stage als afsluiting van je ACO-jaren, hoefde ik daar om niet lang te, na te denken. En je begon een project toen met auto antistoffen en epilepsie. Je stortte je onvermoeibaar op patiëntendossiers en zocht alles wat in de puntjes uit. Ook in die daaropvolgende analyse van de data, dat liep allemaal hartstikke vlot. Je presenteerde die data op symposia en daar ook met een hele eigen stijl, die nu ook nog altijd heel goed herkenbaar is, quasi nonchalant, maar met een uitstekende inhoud. De klinische praktijk, dat was her en der nog wat weer barstig, maar je wierp je vol overgave toen op de laatste hoorders. Want inmiddels waren ook je ambities heel duidelijk. Na mijn studie wil ik onderzoek doen. Onderzoek naar epilepsie. En liefst met een nieuwe techniek ook nog, zoals die diepe hersensimulatie waar jullie zo mee bezig zijn. En ook het pad om dat te bereiken, wat je zelf ook al bedacht. En dat hebben we toen verder uitgestippeld. Je startte met aanvragen voor financiering voor direct experimentele studie. Want dat was het eerste uh, waar we toen aan dachten. Hè? En dat heb je beschreven in je proefschrift. Het, het opzetten en starten van die studie, dat is werkelijk een helder job. Als je het mee als klinicus en klinische wetenschapper vraagt. Maar je liet je niet ontmoedigen en je bleef continu slijpen tot het echt goed op papier stond en dat alles helemaal netjes was. Dat die studie uiteindelijk niet zo liep als verwacht, ja. En dat het toch wel lastig was om de ratten de eindstreep te laten halen, dat leidde toch wel echt wel tot hoofdbrekens. En we hadden een tweede plan sowieso al op de plank liggen. Dus je kon al vooruit met klinische studies, maar ja, die directe studie, dat heeft wel wat hoofdbrekens bezorgd. En toen... Tijdens een van je congresbezoeken gebeurde het. Je werd gevangen door die netwerkanalyses hè, van de groep in Boston. En je besprak al snel die ideeën met ons. En een tijdje later zat jij ook echt in Boston om daar je onderzoek in je droom na te jagen. Fred, in je hele onderzoek, we hebben een heleboel ups en downs gekend, gezien. Je hebt politieke barrières in het onderzoek leren kennen. Hoe dat allemaal werkt. Soms liep je hier ook geheel onwetend en niets vermoedend tegenaan. Maar... Met harde klappen, maar je kwam die keer op keer weer te boven. En je bent onvermoeibaar doorgegaan met ideeën genereren. En dat is, als je het mij vraagt, jou echt je jou allersterkste eigenschap. Uh, en ik moest dan af en, toe, af en toe eens voor een reality check zorgen. Ja, wat soms of vaak waren die ideeën niet realistisch of ver gezocht. Ik zag je dan ook wel een zuchten, verzuchten in onze gesprekken als een mooie idee weer sneuvelde. Maar je werd steeds beter in die ideeën. En het resultaat. Je proefschrift en de rest van jouw werk mag er echt zijn. Wees er ontzettend trots op. Wij zijn dat ook. Als ik zo over zie, denk ik zelf dat de tijden niet veranderd zijn. De tijd kan niet veranderen. De tijd verandert ons. Je bent als mens en als professional veranderd en gegroeid. Genoeg belofte om uit te zien naar een fantastische toekomst, Fred. Heel hartelijk gefeliciteerd met het behalen van je graad als dokter Koem Laude. En ik betrek uiteraard ook graag je familie en naast bij die felicitaties. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Schaper, on behalf of the entire scientific community at Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree and the distinction. Um, I hope you'll be able to continue collaborating uh, with Maastricht University, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear, we'll hear and see more of you. I wish you all the best. And with that, I declare this ceremony ended. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Dankjewel iedereen. Geweldige laudatie ook. Heel, heel leuk. Echt. Heel leuk. Dankjewel. Dankjewel. Ik vond het ook heel leuk, moet ik zeggen. Ik heb er echt van genoten. Ja. Fred, heel erg van genieten van die momenten wat je bereikt hebt. En uh, wijze woorden heb je niet nodig, want er is al heel veel gezegd. En die wijsheid die zit gewoon in jou. En, uh, en je, hebt, uh, je hebt een goede weg gekozen. Heel veel succes. Dankjewel, Jason. Ik heb het niet van een vreemde. Dankjewel, Wallace. Uh, Congratulations, Fred. Van harte gefeliciteerd. Dankjewel, Fred. Super goed gedaan.